Right, hello. Um, I'm just going to try and put my screen on. Is that visible? Yeah, okay. Um, got quite a lot to say. A uh, lot of slides with lots of um, words on it, which is unusual. Normally I wouldn't when I'm doing a presentation, but as we're, we're zooming, it's, it's a slightly different way of doing it. But the messages are, are fairly clear and, um, and, and fairly short. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, summarize as I go. Thank you for everybody who's, who's coming. I've looked at the list of the attendees, which uh, was sent through to me yesterday. And thanks also to, to Warren uh, and Voluntary Sector Northwest for hosting uh, the event for us. Um, we're living in extraordinary times, I don't need to say that to you really. Um, we're, we're, we're facing uncertainties which um, far outweigh those, I, I suppose we might say, from 2008 when there was the last financial crash. But it still tells us something about how the sector responds to, to change. Um, and as we've been tracking the way that the sector does respond to change, how it changes its structure and dynamics over the last uh, 12 years now with, with the sector trends, it maybe gives us a uh, reasonable room for, for hope for the sector. And certainly it, 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 it doesn't encourage me to be um, a, a doom monger or be too negative. I, th I, th I think there's, there's still room to be quite positive about the resilience of the sector. And, and from a personal point of view, I think it's sometimes important for the sector to, to communicate um, its strengths rather than its weaknesses to those who, who fund it, uh, because they want to invest in, in something which is, 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 is going to achieve a lot, which of course it does. So the idea is that we look at what people were telling us in 2019, we'll be back in 2022 um to 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 see what has actually happened it's too soon at the moment really to to know uh we, we began in 2008 um but in the northwest we began in 2016 apart from cumbria which has been uh, involved in the survey right from the start and as warren has just mentioned this is a study of of, of formal organizations incorporated organizations um so if, if you find the numbers um implausible or too low that's because we don't include the uh, those who are below the radar here's an indication of um the size of the sample we're dealing with in northwest england we've got 1212 respondents that's a lot uh, some national studies at the moment are going out with 150 180 respondents and saying it's national but we, we're, we're much bigger than that but it does mean that it's difficult for us to say anything at the sub-regional level um, at this stage, but we can continue with the analysis as we go on. Um, this is the estimates we have, fairly good estimates on formal organisations, um, around about 20,000 in Northwest England, uh, producing um, well over um, three billion pounds of, 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 of salary income. Uh, for 115,000 full-time equivalent staff. So it's a big sector, about 3% of all employment. And if you look at volunteering, similarly, you get a, a, a very strong impression of the, um, the value of the sector uh, that it produces through voluntarily given time. These are proxy measures, they're not, it's not real money, it's the, it's the replacement cost at either national minimum wage or 80% of average wages. So these are figures you can look at later uh, as we get down to the, 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 the substance of, of what we're doing. In 2019, there was a lot of optimism about. Uh, we asked a question about how we felt people thought the sector would, or they, they would, their organisation would develop in the next two years. And there was a, a great deal of optimism. And you can see at the, the bottom of each of these bars, it shows how many uh, third sector organisations had significantly rising income. And it rose as far as 30% for what we call largish organisations with, with incomes between 250,000 and, and a million. But generally things were on the up, and this was very different, if you like, from 2010, when things were definitely on the down. Um, if we do look at, briefly at the um, sub-regions, uh, we can see that the numbers of respondents are, are quite good, but it, it makes it difficult to do uh, complex analysis. But we see that in terms of optimism, um, in 2019, the, you know, the, a lot of organisations had, had had a good deal of success in the previous two years. 
and certainly many fewer had had falling income. That's one indication of well-being. This is another one we have about financial well-being and use of reserves. And if you look at the fourth set of bars, it says it shows how many organisations have used their reserves for essential costs. So it's a good indicator of, of how many are struggling. And, and next time round, we'll obviously look at this again to see, see, see what's happened. But also, if you look at Northwest England, there's, there's quite a sizable proportion of charities and, and social enterprises which have um, don't have any reserves, which me means they're vulnerable. Uh, we'll be coming back to that too. I'm rushing a little bit at the moment so we can get to the, the, the main part later. Are there no grounds for optimism? Well, business and bus private sector businesses and charities are kind of quite different. Uh, businesses tend to borrow money um, in order to, to be able to um, invest in their development, uh, speculate to accumulate, it's often, of, often the expression which is used. But within the voluntary sector, NCVO figures shows that the spending has never outstripped um, income. The sector is naturally cautious about money. Um, so we need to you know, keep that in mind when, when we're, we're, we're making comparisons between different types of organisations. We, we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, there's an awful lot of studies floating around at the moment. Um, I'm sceptical of, 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 of the findings of these surveys, partly because the surveys are very small, but also because I don't know, you don't know, nobody really knows exactly what the, the long-term impact is going to be. And just this morning, as I've released the, the, the survey results to all those people who filled it in, we've asked the one question uh, to, just to tell us whether their optimism or their pessimism has increased or, or fallen. And it, it, it's, it's and also a little box for people to tell us how they feel. And I'm getting a huge mix of responses. Um, some people saying, no, we'll be okay, we're, we're hibernating, we'll, we'll, we'll manage. Some are saying, it's not about money, it's we can't get our volunteers out there because our volunteers are in the third age. They, um, uh, and others say, we can't get access to our beneficiaries. So it's a, a great mix of things that's going on. Some people think their money is, is, is going to be fine. Um, some people uh, are, are foreseeing disaster. So it, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Let's, so I think we should step back I think carefully and um, rather than being too um, urgent in, in, in our response. The tale of three sectors is, is to try and counter um, the tendency in, in, from national think tanks quite often to regard the voluntary sector as one entity. It isn't one entity, it's many entities. Um, and what we're doing here, I think, in, in, in this presentation is talking about three elements of the sector of, of, of smaller medium-sized and, and larger organizations um, the question is what do you mean by small what do you mean by medium what do you mean by large it, it, nobody has a, a shared view on this kind of thing so i've done a little slide um, to show what i mean by it so you, you know what i'm talking about micro organizations are tiny uh, really they they have very low level of income below ten thousand, average around about two and a half thousand but they comprise 45% of the sector. Uh, NCBO use this group as well. Uh, my small charities uh, on, and social enterprises are 10 to 50,000. They're 25% of the sector. Um, medium ones, which most people call small, um, are also 15% uh, of the sector. Um, they have income 50, 250. They're starting to get a bit more formal because they have staff, they have procedures, they have obligations. So they get a little bit more formal, but not that formal. Once you get over 250,000, organizations get more formal, but there's only 12% of, of organizations that group, 250,000 to a million. Um, and then the biggest organizations, are a million plus. Now, many of the surveys you'll see around use the first four boxes as small charities. So that gives you a, a, a sense of where we are. There's two ways of looking at this. One way is looking at the money, the monetary lens, one way is looking at the voluntary lens, and I think it's, it's a useful distinction, and the next slide kind of indicates why. If you use the monetary lens, you can see that the big charities, the ones with a million plus income, absorb an enormous amount of, of the volume of income of, of the sector. Um, the micro organisations, even though there's 45% of the sector is, is micro, take only 1.2% of the income. 
so I'm, I'm using a mix here in, as I talk, I'm talking through the, the, the monetary lens and I'm talking through the voluntary lens. Um, those who rely primarily on voluntary support have a very different sort of experience from those which rely heavily on, on financial support. So let's look at the three types of organisations. The first one is larger organisations, which I'm counting as, as more formal. Um, they are you know, £250,000 income above. They start to have a, um, a, a hierarchical structure. They, they have a, a chief executive or a chief officer. Um, they also, though, rely heavily on volunteers. Um, so we need to ask ourselves through which lens do we look at these bigger organizations? I think sometimes um, or organizations are critical of big organizations. They feel that they're stealing everybody's thunder, that they're hoovering up all the contracts and so forth. But I think we also need to remember that they uh, are the only ones which can often do these, these, these jobs. But even then, many of them don't. Many of them choose not to, to do that kind of work. Just look at reliance on volunteers. If you look at the, uh, the bottom bar or the second bottom line, we could not keep going as an organization or group without volunteers. And it just gives you a sense, if you like, of, of the importance of, 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 of the voluntary lens, even for the biggest organizations, where 50% say they couldn't keep going without volunteers. And I'll give you one example I, I have uh, from an age, age UK in the north of England. Uh, they have about 20 charity shops. That's how they, uh, sustain you know more than 70 percent of their annual income uh, but those charity shop shops run primarily uh, by volunteers so uh, it's it's not right for us to start thinking that big organizations uh, just rely on contracts or just rely on on major grants because because they don't um, I don't think business the, the bigger the sector organizations are just like businesses some are um, I think they're proficient, they have to be formal, they, they have to be hierarchical, they have to be well disciplined. Um, but I think we also need to, to, to recognise that many will face very serious financial problems and redundancies are almost inevitable in, in many and perhaps even most of them. But it doesn't mean they have all their, all their eggs one basket, they, they, they can scale down and, and certainly the qualitative work we do uh, shows how organisations um, are quite good at flexing Tough decisions, no trustees want to make the staff redundant. It, tough decisions are coming their way, uh, but many will have a little bit of breathing space. If they have contracts now, those contracts won't just stop. They'll have a bit of breathing space, but it doesn't mean they've got long to plan. Small organizations. Um, so I'm talking about micros and the, the, the small organizations. They don't employ staff. They might have maybe one or two part-timers uh, rarely do they have a full-time member of staff because they don't have enough income to do so. There's a great many of these organisations uh, and they rely more heavily in resource terms on, on, on voluntarily given time than they do um, on, on, on employee time. And you can actually do some um, proportional uh, analyses of these things. And when you look at the micro organizations pound for pound in turn when you compare the, the the value of the labor they produce through volunteering set against the amount of income they have it, it's a ratio of about 3.5 to 1 so they you know that they, they are they are the engine of the sector and um, and I sort of wonder when people say small but vital and I sort of think well a small and vital actually so it, it's it's a, a play on words let's not apologize for the for the small uh, charities they, they actually do a, a, a tremendous amount and, and are a tremendous resource um, if you look through the voluntary lens and not through the financial lens do we not need to worry about small charities just because they are they maybe they can um, hibernate for a while or maybe they don't need that much money well, I think that would be uh, the wrong message, and it's certainly not the message I'm giving. I think small charities, they, they don't need much money, but they, they value the money that they do get. It makes them feel better, for a start, makes them feel valued, but also it goes a long way. And I think many of the charitable foundations know this. They're, they're, you know, they, they, they know that they can't ask charities to achieve particular outcomes. They know they can't ask them very much about the impact they have because it's too hard to pin down as suggested here 
you know, tackling loneliness, improving health and well-being, building confidence, raising pride in the community, all the things that these tiny little organisations do, uh, you know, have a, a, a very significant impact on, on areas. And it's cumulative as well. And, and there will be some evidence coming out soon, which shows the accumulation um, of support that small groups give to communities um, and, and how they intersect. Uh, it might not be a formal intersection, they might not work together as, as formal partners, but uh, they work in complementary ways, uh, they're good neighbours to each other, um, even if they keep themselves pretty much to themselves most of the time. I think funders need to uh, congratulate themselves that they, they do fund small charities, um, and as I think there'll be a lot of cries from, from um, bigger organisations saying that they're, they're desperate for money, which they will be, but I, I think we must not move the lens too far um, so that they, the small ones suffer. Let's look at the medium ones. The middling sort are the ones I think that most people are talking about when they talk about small charities. I think this, this is the group. The ones who have um, some staff and lots of volunteers uh, in the Northwest, there's certainly around 3,000 of, of, of these organisations. Uh, which are on the go. Um, they have around 73,000 regular volunteers. It, you know, it's, it's, they, they're in, the, in their engine room, they need money and they need freely given time. Um, and they produce around about 12% of their additional value, if you like, in terms of, 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 of staff time through volunteers, um, which is very significant. I worry about the middle ground. Um, I don't like the expression squeeze middle very much because it gives the impression that it's no place that these use organisations are, are somehow not this and not that. They're neither small, they're neither big. That, that means they're nothing. They are something. And I think over the years we've seen medium sized organisations being at the end of a barrage of criticism really for failing. Um, they're not scaling up. They're grant dependent. They, won't take on contracts, they won't do social investment, um, all of these things that, that come through. Um, and there's diagnostic toolkits all over the place which, which try to improve. They're well-meaning, I'm not saying that they're not well-meaning approaches, but I think there's a failure to appreciate what medium-sized organisations are all about. Um, they're small but vital, small and vital as I've, I've already said, but um, from the qualitative work we do, as well as the quantitative work, it seems that many people who lead and run these organisations don't want to get bigger necessarily. They don't want to widen their practice because they're committed very much to uh, people and place. Um, they tend to be there to tackle problems that bigger organisations have overlooked or neglected or, or even caused. So consequently, they're, they're quite sceptical of being given advice on who to be and how to, how to behave and so forth. They, and, and also, they don't work in a managerial way as, as a bigger organisation does. So they, they, they have, a, if you like, a flatter structure because they have to negotiate the relationship between the volunteers and their staff, which is not easy. You know, the, the politics of, of medium-sized organisations are, are, are complex. Um, but it's precarious. Um, I think for many organizations in in this position the leaders com commitment is 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 very strong um but it's quite hard for them to tell their story um about the contribution they make they don't always fit with the outcome frameworks that that, that many people uh, want to see but also they've changed quite significantly since since 2008 2010 what happened was that many organizations recognizing that the, the, the contract game was never really going to be for them, so they, they didn't get into that, and it's certainly less so now. Um, they've not been able to rely on reserves or investments or build investments, and, and you know, they, they, it doesn't bring them much back in terms of interest, even if they do have it. So what a lot of them have done is have got into trading. They, they've got involved in self-generated trading, whether they have a shop or a cafe, or they offer services for sale and so forth. There's a power to change report on this coming out in uh, July from, from this study, which looks at this in a lot of detail. And, and what's interesting is, is not just that they're resilient, but also that they um, are quite innovative in the way that they do different forms of trading in, in tandem with some work from grants, some work from um, 
their, their own fundraising. So they're resilient, but within limits. They need support to keep going. And I think grant funding is, is always going to be a central element of, of, of this. Um, if organisations were able to sustain themselves entirely by trading, then the likelihood is that private sector businesses are there as well. Uh, most of the markets in which they work are not strong enough for them to, 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 to build that, that, that um, financial uh, resilience. Um, having moved into trading though, there's a problem. Uh, many now can't actually do the trading. They can't open their cafes, they can't offer their services, they can't rent their rooms. So they have a cash flow problem and, and it's, it's one that I think many foundations are already starting to look at uh, supporting and, and I think it's a clear priority. So what will happen next? Um, my honest answer is your guess is as good as mine, but we can talk about some other parameters that we should take into account. Um, when we're weighing up the pros and cons of supporting organisations in the crisis, I, I, I don't believe in the imminent collapse arguments that we're seeing a good deal of in the third sector press. Um, the, the sector will flex and and it it will survive and, and relatively few organizations will go and like private businesses where it's very clear when you have to stop because the bank forecloses on you many charities they 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 can um scale down quite significantly and, and keep going um i think it's also premature for us to be talking about sector reform or you know innovation funds as some people are calling for we need we need to take some time uh, to see how things uh, start to shape up, um, and it won't be just over the next few months. It'll be over the next two years at least. Um, money is a problem through the financial lens. We can't ignore this. It's rare, rarely easy to get hold of, and the ground is always shifting. Uh, the sector is competitive when it comes to the issues that it supports. So there's always more claims than there there is money available to come through, and I think at the moment. Uh, for what I'm hearing from some community foundations and other foundations and, and some infrastructure organisations that, that, you know, some organisations are very quick off the mark, um, they're positioning, positioning themselves very quickly, others are uh, slower to, to respond to things and they, they may miss out. Some foundations, community foundations, are, are making strenuous efforts to contact uh, the organisations they fund to, 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 to ask them what support they need and I think that's really helpful. Um, so that it, it's, you know, they, 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 we're seeing around um, in the press a little bit at the moment, the first come, first serve type approach to, to grant giving. I, I think that's probably an exaggeration of what's actually happening on the ground. Um, do we focus on immediate organisational needs or do we look at immediate beneficiary needs? That's a really tough one to call, I think, for funders. And, we need to be careful how we don't go what, too far in one direction or the other. On the worries of cash flow, I think um, I think I've covered some of this already. But I think the the emphasis on bridging the gap, I think, is probably going to be quite tricky. What happens when furloughing uh, comes to an end with, is is obviously the, going to be the, the the pinch point for lots of organisations. Um, this is a sector which doesn't stand still. This is the advantage of having uh, longitudinal research because we, we often hear the sector being talked about as if it was a solid state. Um, and in fact, it, it's not. Um, what we've looked at in the report this year is, is, is the, the enormous number of new organisations which come into the fray um, uh, every time we, we, we do the study. Um, so it has a life cycle where some organisations do close, but more often fade away. Actually, is 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 what 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 we find is that they 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 scale down um, to the point where um, it, it dries up. Uh, the, there aren't usually that many um, dramatic closures. Everybody will have a story of some in every area that we're talking to right now, but. Uh, they're, they're very much in the minority. That might change. I don't. I, I, I don't know for sure. Obviously, um, but we're still seeing startups. Even now, we're seeing startups and quite big startups coming as people respond to things. Fifteen percent of organisations in the latest study we did 
have been established since 2016. So they're the ones where um, needs will be very different from some of the older ones, um, and they'll obviously be treading on some toes. Nothing we can do about that, nothing we should do about that. Civil society is, is, is a, a free and open and sometimes competitive uh, environment. Short-term measures, uh, medium-term adaptation or retrenchment. Um, I think parts of the sector do face urgent need and, and they need that support right now. Um, my emphasis is quite strongly in the report on the middle ground, um, which are facing those serious cash flow problems, which could sink them. Um, very small organizations may be in a position where they can hibernate to some extent. Um, problem for many of them is they can't actually get to their beneficiaries or they can't get their volunteers out. But that, that will recover. And we also see a good deal of anecdotal evidence, admittedly, a good deal of, of evidence of people uh, being really quite innovative in how they do things in, in small organisations to keep things going. Um, bigger organisations probably have a little bit longer to, uh, to, 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 to plan. Some won't, you know, I, I, I can hear the questions kind of being generated in the background there. Some, some clearly won't, but, but, but many will, um, especially those with contracts, because contracts won't stop dead but it does mean that they have to plan for the decline which might follow when they do. So on the final slide, the, the situation is alarming um, and for all sorts of reasons, um, it, it's understandable that, that, that there, is, there is panic a, a, afoot. Um, we do need to take a breath. We do need to see that problems are not universally shared, but, and that means that solutions must not be uh, homogenous solutions, they, they need to be tailored to the part of the sector that you're talking about. Um, I think funders are quite good at that. I think may maybe we sometimes see them as being rather distant and hanging on to the money and, and being very careful, but actually the work we've done in this project sh shows that they're not, that they, they, they do talk to, to each other, they do talk to community foundations, they do talk to uh, infrastructure bodies to see what they need to do. So, you know, everybody needs to keep talking <laughs> is, is probably really very important. We do need to look to the past to see that things can flex. And I think most importantly is that we need to recognize that the sector is populated by extremely determined people who don't give up easily. Agility is a sector strength. And in two years time, for those of you who, who, who help us out yet again with a survey to see what, what's going on, I think we'll be able to see what really came of it. Um, just in case you're interested, the people who are watching, I put a quest one question out today, which is uh, clickable on this site. Um, we can send this to you all later, um, just to see how the mood has changed. Um, so far this morning, a, a couple of hundred people have responded to the question. It already gives me an idea of what's going on, uh, but I'm not going to tell you yet because we need to let it run to see what's happening. But it's a mix. It's a mix of optimism and it's a mix of pessimism. And that's me. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>